together. Yes. And, um, you know, I was late this morning because I was battling. I, don't, I, I think it's day three. It actually might be day four and five. Now I can't remember how many days it's been of this migraine that I self-medicate throughout the day, but then it wakes me up in the middle of the night to the point where I have to go medicate again. And it hit me really hard this morning. And by the skin of my teeth, I made it here. And I get here. And then everybody, they stop, the worship team stops and comes and prays for me. And I'm just bawling because I'm like, this is what we need. Yeah. And immediately the vice grip was gone. I could see again. I could think, I don't know how I got here in my car. <laughs> you know, I, it's just, we need each other so yes. much. And it was just like, you know, I already missed you guys. But it was just a reminder of how special this place is yes. and how important our family yes. is. You guys are my family. Right. We're all family. And I hope that every one of you know that. Just come. Yes. No matter what, this is where our it's where our prayers are answered. This is yeah. where we're encouraged. This is where we're lifted up. We're not meant to do this alone. Yeah. I live in a house full of boys, and I come here by myself. Yeah. You know, yeah. I need some backup when I get here. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so this morning, I was um, trying to um, last yesterday. I was trying to get caught up with the Facebook feeds and see where things have been at and trying to make sure that I'm in the river, so to speak. And then this morning, threw it all out the window. <laughs> the Lord said, just praise me. Yes. Just come, yes. enter the gates, and praise me. So, of yes. course, I immediately go to Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves, but we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. So enter, his, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. Yes. For the Lord is good. Amen. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Yes. Yes. And so I've, I've, this is one of my favorite psalms. I've read it a hundred times. I've studied it a hundred times. But I've never actually looked up some of the original Hebrew words. And I was a little bit surprised at Thanksgiving. The primary meaning of Thanksgiving is confession. When we are giving thanks to God, we don't say thank you. We confess the truth of who he is and of who we are. And by doing, by thanking him, he becomes more real to us, right. and our lives become transformed by our thanksgiving. Yes. And he said, that's just entering the courts. Yep. Yeah. And then he says, oh, and to give thanks is also literally literally an extension of hand. So if anybody wonders why we lift our hands, because we're lifting our hands in thanksgiving. Yes. Yes. We're saying, you, God, it's about you. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, that I need you. Thank you, Lord, that I have you. Yes. Thank you, Lord, that you are yes. good yes. and faithful. Wow. And we enter his courts with praise, literally a song or a hymn mm -hmm. of public praise. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a joy to sing to the Lord. I don't know if you, I, I'm not a great singer, but I love to sing to the Lord. And I must have done it enough. They gave me a microphone. I don't know. But <laughs> I love to sing to the Lord. Yes. It makes my burdens light. Yes. And I feel his presence immediately when I open yes. my voice and I sing. Right. Oh, church, make a joyful noise. Right. And that's his courts. That's not even his presence yet, but he draws us yes. past when we're singing. Yes. He says, ooh, ooh, I hear they're singing about me. They're singing to me. They love me. They want me to be with them. And he comes. And as we enter into his presence, he comes into our midst. Laudation by song, to be lifted high, to be lauded, to be exalted. Oh, I love our songs where we say, exalt you, Lord. Yeah. We exalt you. We lift you high. We lift, that maybe that's why we lift our hands, too, to lift him high. I just can't yes. sing it enough, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to lift him high. Yes. Oh, his name is above every name. Yes. His ways are higher than our ways, but he doesn't judge us. He receives us right. just as we are. Right. And his truth will last forever to all the generations. His truth is his firmness, his steadfastness, right. his fidelity. He is single-mindedly for us. Yes. He is faithful yes. forever. Yes. And in John 4, 23, that was Old Testament praise. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus said in John chapter 4, 
He said, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In truth, in fidelity, in steadfastness, in faithfulness. With that, and, 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 and I looked up the, the, the Greek, or the, whatever, the translation here for truth is a little bit different. It says, without, how does it say that? With personal excellence. Now, not the kind of personal excellence where we have to be moral and upright, but the candor of mind, free from affectation, from pretense, from simulation, from falsehood, and free from deceit. Yeah. What I hear is free. Yes. Come and worship him free, yes. Yes. freely. Yes. You are set free. Yes. You have been set free, and you are righteous, and you are holy, and you are perfect. Yes. You are excellent. And so he says, come. Because now, now we've gone past Thanksgiving. We've gone past praise. Now we're worshiping. Yes. And he says, I want you to come just like you yes. are. Come exactly how you are. When you get up, when you roll out of bed, come on in. Come in your jammies. Just come. Yes. Come and yes. worship him. Yes. In spirit and truth. Yes. We are spirits. Our spirits yes. are one with yes. our God who yes. is spirit. Yes. We have been made one. Yes. And when we worship when we rejoice, oh, that's the intimate moments where things are birthed, yes. where the seed is sown, right. where things change. Yes. That's spirit and truth. Yes. And that is worship. Worship is more than singing. Yes. Right. Worship, yes. that, that's just entering yes. the courts. Yes. But now right. we're so far past that. Right. We have been made one yes. with our God. Yes. So this is why when we come, when we, when we praise we come just as we are. We take time for prayer requests. We lay down our burdens and we exchange. Yes. God came, Jesus yeah. came to exchange yeah. our sin for his righteousness. Yes. And he says, come, yes. trade the garment of heaviness for the spirit of praise. Yes. Come and exchange your burden. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, but you have to lay down yes. that which weighs you down. But come, yes. come just as you are. Oh, he yes. longs for us just as much as we long for him. Yes. Come free. Yes. You are free. Yes. Anything holding us back, anything weighing us down, let it go. Yes. And let it exchange. Make that exchange. Say, God, I give it to you. And oh, he gives us yes. blessings. Yes. Blessings. Yes. Blessings. Yes. Because we trust him and because we believe his word. That's right. You are blessed and highly favored. Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh. So let's enter his courts with thanksgiving. Yes. Enter his gates, enter his courts with praise. And let's worship. Let's lay down and exchange our burdens and take up his yoke. And watch what he will do. In Jesus' name. And that's why the enemy didn't want me at church this morning. <laughs> Just so we're clear. <laughs> he says, you don't feel good. You have a migraine. And I said, by God is going to drive my car to church because I yeah. can't see straight, and I'm going to get there, and I'm coming just like I am. Yes. Just like I am, and yes. you know what? The minute I got here, I don't have a headache. What headache? What yeah, migraine? Right. I didn't even take any pills. Yeah. I didn't need to because I'm free. Yes. I'm free. I want you all to be free. Yes. Jesus. Yes.
being distracted by these issues and, and uh, the Lord said no these are just distractions you yes. gotta take the distractions to the church yes. so that being done I'm glad you're all here I'm glad you're back and uh, the Lord's going to do some awesome stuff today the, the second thing I want to bring up is uh, Shelly my granddaughter we were here Wednesday night and praying over the youth group situation and, and uh, the Lord dropped on her CIA Christ in action uh, will be the Christ in Action Youth Ministries here. Uh, we'll start promoting it, start working with it, and yes. uh, getting downstairs prepared for the youth, uh, the older youth, not the children, little children. That the ministry is definitely being handled Amen. nicely by Jamie and those associates with you guys. Um, but the Lord dropped that on Shayla, my granddaughter. I, I thank God for that, that she has an ear to hear. So watch, watch and grow. Amen. 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 Texas, 
And he's really excited to see West, if he used to live here because then he said that he's going to come here to church with me every Sunday. somebody there, they was telling me about this person that used to go to another church with us and how this other person had to get out of the room with them because of their spirit. It was just so negative all the time, even though they're supposed to be Holy Ghost filled. And I think how sad that is. And I, uh, another situation, I was looking on Facebook this morning and somebody was talking about, again, they're in the same organization that we used to all be in, some of us used to be in, and it was like uh, the old song, Maybe one more mile to go, you know, we're going to lay down our heavy load when we get home. I thought, what a way to go to church. You know, like, I'm like, you're crazy. I want to say something, sir. I'm like, no, come on. I remember the whole song that we used to sing, and you come in and you're going, Lord, have mercy, you know? Why do we have a heavy load? That's not what the Lord wants. I thought, I don't know how she's going to rejoice this morning after posting this song and wanting to know which of us knew it. I mean, it was all I could do not to type something. I I still type. <laughs> but, you know, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that when we come into the house of the Lord, we yes. can be happy. And not only then, I mean, it's like an everyday thing where we can be happy because, yes. I mean, every day it's like I get to tell somebody, hey, you know, the kingdom, quit looking out there, quit looking out there. The kingdom of God's here. Bring heaven down to earth. I mean, we just get our thoughts because of past teaching so warped and so just yes. really just. I don't know. It's almost demonic sometimes, it seems like. Yeah. But, um, I'm so glad just just for the, the love of the Lord, for the word that you gave this morning. I mean, yes. it's just powerful. And, and so I was glad when it said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Yes. 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 Amen. Yes.
protecting and receiving yeah. and uh, like-minded uh, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Thank the Lord that we have so much to rejoice for. And, and that's what uh, renews us, you know, yeah. getting in contact with God, rejoicing with them and making, uh, making ourselves available to what yeah. he's wanting to do, which is right. beyond what we can even imagine. So, right. you know, it's just... Uh, Unlimited, but uh, what we're involved in here. And, uh, mm -hmm. It's just a great journey that's uh, really just begun. So praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. knit together by your hand, Lord, that you continue to search out those who have not yet found their home, who have not yet found their place here. Lord, that you stir up the gifts in each of us, Lord. Stir up the gifts in our heart, Lord. Renew our minds, Lord, by your word. Oh, let us walk by faith in spirit and truth. Let us just trust you. Let us trust you. Let us trust that we hear you, that we know you and we hear you, and that you guide our steps, Lord, that you give us the words to speak, Lord. Give us.
this boldness, Lord, as never before, to speak your truth, Lord, to sow those seeds in this world that is so desperate for something true, for something real. Lord, that you heal the religious hurts and the hearts of the people in our lives around us. Oh, that they may have eyes to see and ears to hear the message of your grace, of your goodness, of your love, your unfailing love. That you continue your ministry here in this house through each and every person. In Jesus' name. Check your cell phones, James. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever else may have brought a cell phone, please check your cell phones. <laughs> and we are going to have a Thanksgiving dinner. Yay! Next Sunday. Yum oh. Oh, we have some good cooks in this church. You will not want to miss. Maybe Addie might want to come visit again next weekend. It's gonna be delicious. <laughs> Birthdays. Whoop it, whoop it up. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll incorporate all that into the, into the Thanksgiving. Yeah. All right. Do we have a sign up sheet or anything? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, great. All right. All right, let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law, therefore I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function, and I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. John and Toby, you two want to come take the offering this morning, please? Toby, you want to ask the boys to play? Lord, we're thankful that you're here today. Yes, we come here to give you praise and glory for you are worthy. God, we just ask that we shut out the outside world and just release to you, God. Forget all our cares about this everyday life and go back to you, Lord. We're calling to you to hear goodness, your word, and your truth, Lord God. Just leave everything there, Lord, as we worship you. For you are worthy of all praise and glory, God. Yes. Now, God, we just ask that you anoint this word spoken here today, God, that we take it with us, God, and share it to this world that's in dire need. Yes. Lord, we just also ask that you will bless this offering. Bless the gift and the giver in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
on that mute. We're having a home revival in the corner here. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Peace, 
bright and morning star, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Can't stop, praise His name, I just can't stop, praise His name, I just can't stop, praise His name, Jesus. Can't stop, praise His name, I just can't stop, praise His name, I just can't stop. It's coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound. I can hear the sound. Woo! Come on now. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming down. I can hear the sound of the river coming. It's coming down. It's coming down.
more trouble. No more trouble. No more trouble. Since I laid my burdens down. No more trouble. No more trouble. Since I laid my burdens down. I feel better.
Heavenly Father's in this room right now. Just embrace him for your healing. Praise God. Let's all thank Him this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank the Lord. Amen. I don't know what kind of a week you've had. I've heard it from several people here already this morning. But you know, whatever it's been and whatever the cause, his mercies are new every morning. Peace. Praise the Lord. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Praise yes. the Lord. And God sees every day that way. Praise the Lord. His mercies endure forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The devil tries to come tell you, well, you know, you screwed this up. You screwed that up. You didn't do this. You did do that. You shouldn't have done this. Just trust me. God loves you. His grace is sufficient. Yes. Praise the Lord. Nothing has changed. Hallelujah. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. So the Sunday school kids, go ahead. Thank the Lord. We've got a humming up here. Praise the Lord. better praise God thank you Myron praise the Lord
You know, I thought about uh, retiring, and uh, I approached Sally about it, and she said, well, you know, the problem with that is that what I've discovered, she said, is that if you retire, I get twice as much husband and half as much money. <laughs> so I'm going to be at this for a little while longer, praise <laughs> the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Just kidding. Praise the Lord. What I said was true, but I'm not really going to do that, hallelujah, because twice as much of me means twice as much of her. <laughs> Thank the Lord. And I've already got one who leads me and guides me. Yep. <laughs> so it gets confusing, you know. Praise God. He's a good God, though. Amen. And he loves us all the time. Praise yep. the Lord. I'm so grateful to know him. And it's just because of his grace that I do. Praise the Lord. Let me just read this to you. This really isn't part of my text, but I think it would be worth uh, uh, looking at. Amen. Chapter 6 of Hebrews, and verse 1, says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, or maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And that repentance of dead works literally translates repentance of religious traditions or ceremonies. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have what we have. It just means that this is what we do to reach out to God, to, to try to fellowship with one another and try to minister to God. But what the Scripture is teaching us here is that this is about the relationship with God and not about our various approaches to worship or to traditional kind of things that we do. I mean, come on, we all have... Traditions. You say, well, we don't have traditions here. Yeah, we do. We, we know about how many songs are going to be sung. We know about how long I'm going to preach. You, you'd like to think you do, but I see, you know, as we get close to the time you think I should be done, there's squirming and there's a little bit of uncomfortableness, praise the Lord. And most of it starts right there, praise God. No, just kidding. But I'm just saying, so we have traditions. We just, you know, they're just not all the same. They're different everywhere. But, but nevertheless, what God is saying is don't make that the priority. Make him the priority. Right. Don't make our, our religious kind of doings the priority. Make him the priority. Right. Amen? And he'll take care of everything else. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, so I want, I've got a bunch of scriptures here that I need to start with just to kind of, I don't know, lay a foundation or bring this into some kind of context at some point. So we'll start with... Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and then we'll read verses 8 and 9, okay? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and then we'll go to verses 8 and 9. In the beginning, God. That's enough. Praise the Lord. In the beginning, God, right? All right, verses 8 and 9. And God called the firmament heaven in the evening and the morning were the second day, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to I look at something else here too. In the beginning, God, right? And then chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Praise the Lord. In the beginning, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Now, I think it was Tim that mentioned earlier, and this is it's true, and that's the, where we draw that conclusion, is that God met with them every day, a continuous revelation of himself and interaction with them, a relationship with them. So in the beginning was God and then God interacting with people, God wanting to show himself merciful and loving and so forth, okay? 
Okay, that's the, that's the, the beginning, all right? Now let's look at Exodus chapter 40. Exodus 40 and verses 34 and 35. Try to keep these in your head somewhere. Praise the Lord. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. This is the tabernacle Moses that Moses built according to the plan of God. A cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So this is the next phase where, because man sinned, he no longer had this interaction with God, this relationship with God. So God gives Moses then this plan for the tabernacle to supply a way for man and God to come together again in the Holy of Holies, right? So that's what we're talking about here. And when they built this tabernacle, the glory of God came immediately, and it was so powerful, the, the presence of God and the glory of God, that they couldn't even come close to it, amen? Because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, I'm not going to read this, but just most of you probably already know this. If not, you can look it up for yourself. But eventually, we'd come to Solomon's temple, and we know that when they built Solomon's temple, when they dedicated that temple, the glory was so powerful when God showed up in that tabernacle or in that temple that the the priests were unable to minister. They just laid them out. So the presence of God was so strong and so vital and real that it was uh, beyond their human capacity to deal with it. Amen. All right. Now let's look at John, verse uh, chapter fourteen. John fourteen verses sixteen and seventeen. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Spirit of God, right? Praise the Lord. All right, and then we'll finish with this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? Ye are not your own. Everybody say praise the Lord. Lord. Okay, so uh, over the years I've had a lot of different jobs, and at one point I was building houses. When I first got into the ministry and came up here to Iowa after we left Texas, I worked with another pastor who was a uh, a builder, a, a, a contractor, and I built houses with him up in Ames for a while, and then I worked for a couple, I had another buddy of mine here that lived in Des Moines, I worked with him years ago too, so uh, I did carpentry work and roofing and all that kind of thing. So if you're, when you're building a deck or if you're building walls, generally you, you build the walls on the ground, you set them up, then you tie them together, but when you're building walls, you generally have a I don't know, anywhere from 8 to maybe 20, depending on the length of the wall, of course, two-befores that are upright. They're called studs. That's what you nail everything to. Well, they're all the same size. The ceiling height is the same, so all, the, all these two-befores, all these studs are going to be the same size. So what you typically do is you cut one, you measure one, measure twice, cut once, measure it, and then you cut it to size, and then you can use that as a template for all the rest of them. So you don't have to measure every one. You can lay that board on. The problem is, if you don't continue to use that original one that you cut, they'll get off eventually. I mean, if, you, if I cut this one, lay this one on that one, cut that one, then take that one and lay it on another one, cut that one, then take the one that I just yeah. measured and lay it on another one, over a period of time, they'll either be too short or they'll be too long because yeah. you'll, you'll deviate from that original. So little by little, you go off too long or too short. So you always go back to that original template, the original one, to get your measurements. So in other words, if your basic premise is inaccurate, every subsequent conclusion will be inaccurate. Right? If you launch a rocket to Mars and you're off one inch at the takeoff point, you'll miss Mars by a thousand miles. Just one inch here, 
By the time you get out there, you're in some other planet, praise the Lord. So lots of people, uh, religious people, have started off with good intentions, but they end up becoming the biggest fighters, the most confrontational, the haters, and the dividers. The solution to religion, to legalism, and to division is that we correct all the way back to Jesus. Not what we have grandparents decided, great grandparents, somebody else decided and then passed it on and passed it on and passed it on. We have to go back to what Jesus taught and back to the spirit in which he taught it. Anything short of that and you end up a modern day Pharisee. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19 again. What? I have a daughter that says that all the time. I'll say something, she'll say, what? Like, I know she heard me. But it's like, I can't believe that came out of your mouth. What? You, you actually believe that? You, you said that? You are so stupid. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own. Praise the Lord. Yes. Now, this, this verse about our bodies being temples is way more than I ever thought it was. The more I began to study this, the more I began to see it in the context of the whole Bible, the more it began to change. Now, y'all may be way ahead of me when it comes to this, so if you are, just be patient. Praise the Lord, because I'm a little slow. <laughs> Amen. But the temple is a place of worship. And it was a place of worship in Paul's time and in the time of Jesus. It was specifically the place where heaven and earth met, where God came here. Praise the Lord. And uh, heaven was seen as, as God's dimension. Or this is, that's where God operates, amen? The place where he dwelt. Where everything that he spoke was happening just the way he spoke it. No deviation. Whatever he says, that's it. That's what it is. In heaven, it's perfectly in tune with God, with the thoughts of God, with the plan of God, and with the purpose of God. So the temple was a place where human space collided with God's space. Praise the Lord. So one of the great themes of, of Scripture, uh, as you look through the Bible and study the Bible, from the beginning all the way to the end, isn't just to get people saved. You say, well, it's got to be. No, well, it's really not. But it's really the main theme there is for God to dwell down here with his people. We think sin is, a hu is such a big deal. Well, it is a big deal, but it's not the big deal. It was just in the way of God dwelling with his people. Amen? It, sin wasn't the problem. The problem was God couldn't be with his people because of the sin. So he just dealt with the sin so that now he can dwell with us, so that he can be with us. That was always what God wanted. All we read it. He, he, God is and then he creates man, and the next thing you know, God is interacting with man. That's the way he wanted it to be. Well, then Adam fails, and now sin has come between. He was sin innocent before that, right? He was innocent, so God was able to interact with him on a you know, face to face basis, you could say. But because of sin, it separated man, and so then God had to come up with another means by which he could come and still be in contact with humanity, right. even though they're sinners. So he has the holy place, the holy of holies, where after they offer up their sacrifices, now the high priest is legal to come into contact with God. Remember the, the mercy seat, which is the lid basically of the ark, and it covers those commandments. It covers those Ten Commandments. So he'd come in there once a year on the Day of Atonement and sprinkle blood on that mercy seat, and uh, then he could, have he could approach God, and God could take away the judgment for their sin, for another year. Well, Jesus comes, and, and, in, and in the New Testament, when you read, it, it describes Jesus 
It describes him as the Elasterion. I've talked about this before, but that word simply means mercy seat. So Jesus is our mercy seat. Jesus is the thing that comes between us and the law. So when God looks down, he doesn't see the law. He sees Jesus. So judgment has already been dealt with. You might say praise the Lord because unless you're way different than me, you need some of that mercy seat this week. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We all do. We need it all the time. Amen. And that's why God did it the way he did it because he wants to be with us. He doesn't want to be a far off distant judge, angry. He wants to be a near loving father. Praise the Lord. So the tabernacle was built for that purpose. And then, of course, Solomon's temple was, was to be a dwelling place for God with his people. But because of idolatry, because of sin, amen, disobedience, God couldn't remain. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm not going to go back and read all these. You can go look for it for yourself. But just for one example here, let's look at this in 1 Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 11. Now, praise the Lord, I'll get ahead of myself. But um, the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Now, if you want to go back and do a little history here, you'll find that Hophni and Phinehas were a couple of real jerks. Yep. I mean, they were naughty boys, praise the Lord. <laughs> they, they, now, remember, this is under the sacrificial system. This isn't today. Right. This isn't where grace is involved in that sense. There was grace available, but it was under this prescribed method. Well, Hophni and Phinehas were the sons of the high priest, therefore they were priests, because it was a genealogical thing, but they were he, they were hedonists, they were beyond that. These guys were having uh, prostitutes in the temple, they, had, they were doing all kinds of stuff, they were stealing the sacrifices to have feasts. Right. A certain amount of the sacrifice went to the priests for their uh, livelihood. You know, that's, how, that's where they got their food, they'd get a certain portion of whatever the sacrifices were. But these guys were taking... They were taking anything they want. Whatever looked the best, yeah. that's what they took. And they ate it for themselves. They didn't give it. They didn't offer it to God. They took it to their own little barbecue stand and had a party. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of stuff going on that was totally contrary to the word of God. And that's why the ark was taken. They were overcome by their enemies because of this. Remember, right. continue to keep in mind, this is Old Testament now. Right. All right, now let's look at verses 21 and 22 of the same chapter. Chapter 4, verses 21 and 22. Now, one of these boys' wife was pregnant. And she had a little boy. And please don't ever name your kid Ichabod. <laughs> I mean, it's worse than the schoolmaster, you know, the headless horseman, Ichabod, Ichabod Crane. Right. Nah, it's worse than that. She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. And that's what Ichabod means. It means the glory has left. So she named the child Ichabod because the glory had departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. They were both dead. They died. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. Okay? So we, we read about the, the exile into Babylon and it goes from there all the way to the very last sentence of the Old Testament where Israel is, is wondering, when will God return to dwell with us? Praise the Lord. It's the whole struggle that they're having. Hundreds of years of, of longing, of aching, of praying for God to come back and be with them again. Amen? That God would do a new thing, a big thing. That God would do a monumental thing and come and dwell with his people again. And then it happened. Yeah. Just didn't happen the way they thought it was going to happen. It didn't happen the way they expected. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now, the Jews would have recognized this immediately that this is the same introduction that they had to Genesis. In the beginning, God. Amen? God's presence, in other words. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So before anything, God shows up. Right? All right, look at John 
1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Praise God. Now that, that Greek word that's translated dwelt here and dwelt among us is the Greek word eskinosin, which literally is to fix a tent, to pitch a tent. So he's saying the word was made flesh and he pitched a tent here, a tabernacle. Yes. Yes. Praise God. John is saying that Jesus is pitching his tent, his, his holy tabernacle, his temple among the people, among us. Praise God. His body is now the place where heaven and earth come together. Praise the Lord. The temple system reached its fulfillment, praise God, because it was always just a type of the great temple, Jesus. Yes. Yes. Believe me, God wasn't in the temple when Jesus showed up. They were still going through the motions, but the glory was gone. It had departed hundreds of years before and hadn't returned. And that's why they prayed next year, you know, Jesus, come Messiah. The Messiah's got to come. Why? Because they needed God's presence again, and he wasn't anywhere to be found. So here he shows up. God's tabernacle, God's temple right here with us. Amen? His body is now this place where heaven and earth come together, where they, where they meet. Amen? The temple, that whole system, reached its fulfillment when Jesus was born. Whether anybody ever understood that at that point or not is a, is a whole other issue, but that's the fact because this great temple is all that the other temple was ever there for in the first place was to point us to the real temple. Right. Amen? The glory of God has returned to his temple, and it looks like a Jewish rabbi. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How strange is that? They were not expecting that. They were expecting something else. A bigger right. building, uh, you know, more extravagant, something. You know, any, something's going to happen. A cloud will show up. Right. But no, the, 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 the temple, here it is, and it looks like a Jew. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at this again. John 1.1 1, 1 and, and verse 14. Look at 1.1 1, 1 first again. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Amen? In the beginning, God shows up. And that Word, that God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John is saying, Jesus is the new Genesis. Praise the Lord. Now, you may not agree with me, but that's okay. We all got a right to be wrong and have an opinion. Praise the Lord. But I'm telling you, this is what God is showing me. Amen. Amen. So Jesus is the new Genesis, the beginning of a new creation. And I've got plenty of Bible for that. I just didn't give you all the scriptures because I don't want to spend all day here. I wouldn't mind it, but I know you don't want to. So it's all on you. Praise the Lord. But I'm just saying, he, Jesus is the new, the new Genesis, the new creation. Praise the Lord. And we are new creations in Christ. Right? Praise the Lord. So God himself is pitching his tent with us, with his people. Praise the Lord. Now, what if we really believe that? <laughs> Amen. Think about it. What if we really got it? Praise the Lord. He made a way to where he'd never leave the temple again. Exactly. Yes. Hmm. Praise God. John says, God really does want to dwell in me. Yes. Amen? He really wants to pitch his tent in my life. Yes. Praise God. Jesus is God who comes close. Mm -hmm. A God who is near. Yes. Who can touch and be touched. Exactly. God who literally becomes one of us. Yes. And he does that so that he can accomplish his purpose, yes. his plan. Yes. And they rejected him. Right. 
They said, no thanks. This is not what we were looking for. He looked too strange. He was a baby. Or he was just a little peasant boy, a carpenter's kid, yeah. illegitimate in their eyes. Yeah. Right. A rabbi? Eaten with drunks, prostitutes, sinners? Mm -hmm. This can't be right. See, the reason for that, for us, is to see that you cannot put God in your religious box. Right. Right. He is God. Yeah. We're made in his image. Yes, we are. He isn't made in ours. Right. Praise, the Lord. Praise the Lord. And if we reverse that, we miss him. Right. We miss his mercy. We miss his plan for our life. We miss his goodness. And his grace. Right. Now, just before the crucifixion, Jesus did some, uh, what I think was weird stuff. I mean, unusual. Didn't seem normal to me. He rode a donkey into Jerusalem. He overturned the money changers, which had, I mean, we think it's a horrible thing, but it's what had been going on for centuries. They had to have the Hebrew money, the uh, Jewish money, the Roman currency, whatever currency people brought had to be converted to temple money. Mm -hmm. Amen. They didn't, you couldn't just go to the, you know, American Express or someplace or some bank and get it converted. This is where it happened so that you could buy sacrifices and so on and so forth. Now, it was, it was you know, it was uh, perverted and, 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 and uh, beyond what it should have been. But nevertheless, it was that's the tradition. So Jesus goes in and he flips all these money changers' tables over, right? And then he curses a fig tree. So let me show you that this is all about Jesus. It's all about us getting revelation. It's not a history book. It's not a story. It's a revelation of God and how much he loves us and how much he wants to be with us. You say, well, he might want to be with you, but he probably doesn't want to be with me. No, he wants to be with you. Hallelujah. He loves you. Yes. I don't care what kind of guilt stuff the devil tries to throw on you. He does it to all of us. Yes. And he's got plenty of ammo because we give it to him. Yes. But it's okay. God sees us as perfect yes. in the beloved. Amen? Accepted. Hallelujah. All right, let's look at this. In 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 12 and 13. Now, Jesus is do, dealing with these Jews. These are religious Jews, so they know the scriptures. They know the scriptures, and they know what he's talking about. They play these little games trying to trick him and trip him up, but the truth is he's, he's revealing himself through the scriptures. He said all of, the, all of the Bible, all of your scriptures, all of the prophets, everything points to me. You search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but they're talking about me, and you don't know it. You're not getting it. Right. Praise the Lord. So they said, it is false. Tell us now. And he said, thus and thus spake he to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then they hasted and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with trumpets saying, Yehu, Jehu is king. Now I'll just, give me, I'll just give you a little bit of background for the sake of time, but if you go back to Ahab and Jezebel, we know how corrupt they were, right? Remember the prophet said, the dogs will lick your blood before the day is over, said that to Jezebel. She was thrown off the balcony and killed and, and all this. So, and they, these were corrupt people. They were the king. He was the king. Right. Amen. Ahab was the king. And he, got, he, he had everything, but it was kind of like David, you know, and the lamb. He had all the sheep he wanted, but this guy's got one lamb and I want it. It's, it's like Bathsheba. Yes. David had a harem. I mean, he could have any woman he wanted. But he wanted the one he didn't have. Right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
And Ahab did the same thing. There was a field. He wanted the field because his wife wanted the field. So he just stole it and killed the guy that it belonged to. Now, this is just the beginning or, or, or the kind of the revealing of how corrupt these people were and how ungodly and unconnected to God they were. Well, now, they passed on, but their kids are now, their sons are now the king. Praise the Lord. So basically, the story is saying, this is Jehu. The prophet comes to him, and he says, don't tell anybody this, but I want you to go directly to these people and tell them what I told you. He sent a man to, to Jehu and had him pour oil over him and, and declare to him that God had anointed him king. And he said, now, you go leave here immediately. He tells the guy that, that anoints him. He said, get out of here right away. So Jehu is anointed king, and he leaves, and he goes out, and, they, and everybody's saying, well, hey, what was that all about? What, what, did, what did he say? And so that's what we're reading. The guy, Jehu, is saying, uh, it is false. Tell us now. Don't lie to us, in other words, about what this is about. And so he says, this messenger that came, thus and thus spake he to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. So this is Jehu speaking to these people that are asking what this was all about. Amen? So these people that he tells that he has been anointed king, they hasted and took every man his garment and put it under him, under Jehu, on the top of the stairs and blew with trumpets saying, Jehu is king. In other words, they said, we agree. You're the king. Amen? So basically the story is there was a current king in place. There was already a king in Israel. He was corrupt, but he was a king. And Jehu completely upstages him and completely usurps the guy's authority. Right? Amen? So the people then show agreement with him by putting their cloaks at his feet. Now the Jews of Jesus' time knew this. They would have known the scriptures. They would have understood it. So look at Matthew chapter 21, verses 6 through 9. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. He told them there will be a donkey waiting for you. Now Jehu rode a horse. But he was like the conquering king, right? So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded, and they bought the, brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon, set Jesus thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, threw their cloaks under him. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. Jesus is entering Jerusalem, the place where the temple was. The temple has become corrupt. We got a new tabernacle. There's a new sheriff in town. His name is Jesus. Amen? God has declared him to be the temple. And as he rides into Jerusalem, the people are consenting to this, and the, and the rabbis and the priests know it. And that's what's freaking them out, because their rice bowl is being messed with. Praise the Lord. They see the corruption is being dealt with by this rabbi who claims to be the Messiah. And the people are acknowledging he is the tabernacle of God, not that building that we've been going to. Praise the Lord. So the crowd spreads their clothes on the ground, and they say what? Hosanna to son of David which means Savior, King. Hosanna, Savior, and King. And so what does Jesus do next? Matthew 21, verses 12 and through 14. And Jesus went into the temple of God, and he cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him, 
in the temple, and he healed them. Praise the Lord. So Jesus goes to the temple, and he flips over the money changers' tables. And what offends Jesus isn't this tradition of money changing, but it's something else altogether. Matthew chapter 21, verses 13 and 14 now. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Praise God. Amen. Now what Jesus did is actually he came up with a hybrid phrase that was two different scriptures from the Old Testament. Right? He says, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. That's, that's actually two different scriptures from the Old Testament. So he joins them together and makes one declaration out of it. Now they knew this too. They knew the scriptures. Praise the Lord. So in Jeremiah, well, let's look at this first. Isaiah 56 and verse 7. I'm not just trying to give you historic evidence here. I'm trying to tell you this is God's plan, has always been God's plan to be in you, yes. to dwell in you, yes. to be close to you. Yes. Hallelujah. And grace had to come in order for him to do it. Yes. That's why grace is so incredibly important today because he doesn't ever want to leave again. And he's not going to leave again, and he doesn't have to because grace keeps us righteous in the eyes of the Lord, even when we are unrighteous. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer. And here's what's incredibly important. For all people. Yes. For everybody. Praise the Lord. All right. There's half of this hybrid that he uses. The other is Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 11. So the house of prayer for all people. But instead of being a house of prayer for all people, it had become exclusive to the Jews and their religion. Even half the Jews couldn't get into the temple because they were called unclean, because they were blind, because they were lame, because they were whatever, divorced or had some other issue going on, Right? No, no Gentile could get in there. They had a court, an outer court where the Gentiles, that was it. That's Women it. couldn't come in. Right. Right. Is this house, which is called by my name, this is Jeremiah 7, 11, is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. So he's saying, this house, this my house, is a Nothing but a bunch of thieves and robbers. Is, does it look that way to you? That's what he's saying. Because it, it looks that way to me. Right. Praise the Lord. So robbers, that, that's like insurrectionists. Right. Instead of Israel and the temple being good news to everybody, to all people, amen, Israel declared that everybody outside of their little group was evil. Everybody but them was unclean. Praise the Lord. So there was no access to the temple. Except for this small group of corrupt people. That's what Jeremiah 7 is really all about. You can read it for yourself. Read the whole chapter. It's all about how corrupt Israel is. How sinful they are. How, how unconnected to God they really are. Praise the Lord. So let's look again at Matthew chapter 21, verse 14. I'm so glad. I'm so, so glad. <laughs> Amen. I'm so glad that I was born at this time. Yes. Yes. In the age of grace. Yes. Where God has done everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To be with me. To never leave me or forsake me. Amen. No matter how screwed up I get. No matter how screwed up I do. That's right. Thank you, he's made a declaration. Yes. And he's a God. Not a man. That he should lie. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. And he healed them. I mean it's like a slap in the face. These people were unclean. Yes. They had flaws. They had problems. They had issues. And so they weren't allowed in the temple. The first thing Jesus does after he 
flips these tables and gives them this hybrid phrase, he starts healing people that weren't supposed to be there. He starts embracing these unclean by the religious laws and said, come unto me, all you that hunger and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I'm here to heal you. I'm here to deliver you. I'm here to love you. Praise the Lord. The blind and the lame, the unclean. Praise the Lord. The very people Jesus heals are those that had no access to God. He healed him. And if you remember right, when he would heal somebody, he'd say, and your sins are forgiven you. Yes. Remember the Jews got all freaked out about, who does he think he is that he can forgive sin? And he said, hey, is it any more difficult to say you're healed than it is to say your sins are forgiven? It takes God. Yeah. He said, I'm healing you and I'm forgiving you. And that's what salvation is. That's what the cross is. When we got, when we got saved, when our, when our bodies and our flesh and our sin and all that was cleansed at the cross... We were healed at the same time. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We were prospered at the same time. It was all yes. given to us at the same time. Yes. It's not any harder for God to heal you than to save you. Right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So he overturns, let's think about it. He overturns these tables of the money changers. Now remember, what Jesus is really saying here is, that temple, that's not what this is about. I'm what that is about. And you thought that is what that was about. That was just talking about me. And because you didn't understand that, you don't accept me. Amen. We've made religion our God. Right. To a large degree, it's more about doing what we do traditionally and going through the motions than it is about him. And because of that, we become exclusive as well. We even become so exclusive, we can't even be a part of it. Right. <laughs> we can be so exclusive that I can't be in the club that I started. Right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But think about this. Why is he up turning these tables? Well, I'll tell you why. Because in order to buy a sacrifice, you had to have the money. You had to take your currency and exchange it for temple currency. When the money gets thrown on the floor, you can't buy a sacrifice. If you can't buy a sacrifice, you don't get a sacrifice. So the sacrifice is stopped. Now, albeit temporarily, because, but Jesus was trying to make a point. All of a sudden, the sacrifice is stopped because nobody could buy one. Jesus is just trying to tell you, 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 you can't buy this sacrifice. Right. It's free. Right. And all of those sacrifices that came before, just types and shadows. Right. Just like the temple itself. They were just to point to me. And here I am, and you're still going on with business as usual. And you're missing your day of visitation. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, Matthew 21 again, uh, verses 18 and 19. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. Now he'd been in Jerusalem, he'd done this stuff, and he left because of the, the, the disciples were freaking out because they thought they were going to come and get him that night because he had really irritated some people. I mean, these Jews understood all this. Remember, he's, this is Jews that he's talking to, that he's working with, amen, that he's interacting with. So they got this. Now, in the morning, as he returned unto the city, he hungered. So when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, and he found nothing thereon but leaves only. And he said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered up. Praise the Lord. So it's not any coincidence that one of the first things Jesus does after the public upheaval, amen, is curse a fig tree for not bearing any fruit. And the reason for that is the fig tree was a type of Israel's leaders in the first century church, right. in, in the temple system. Because if you, if you go back to the scriptures, you'll see where he says, he talks about that when you see the fig tree blossom, right. 
know that the time is short? What's that mean? It means that the fig tree's starting to put on fruit again. Yep. How are they going to do that? Unless you're attached to the vine, you can't bear any fruit. Exactly. Israel comes to Jesus. Yes. Amen? Yes. They yes. forget the temple. We're coming to Jesus. And that's the only way you can bear any fruit. Right. So he says, this is just like Israel. Right. They've got all the signs of, of a healthy religious system, but the problem is there's absolutely no fruit coming out of them. There is no spiritual evidence of God's being connected to them. Come on. Come on. Praise the Lord. Right. You say it about a lot of churches today. Yes. Praise the Lord. Well, these, the Jews had lost their way. They, they, were, they were confused. They were, they were trying to figure out what was the reason for their existence. Because they were no longer a nation of priests that were there to welcome people to God. They weren't doing what they were there to do. They weren't embracing the lost, the hurting, the unclean. They were driving them away. Right. The very purpose for which God brought them into existence in the first place was the very opposite of what they were doing. So instead, they see everybody else as their enemy. Everybody else is unclean, which is why Jesus shows up and starts cleaning the blind, the lepers, yes. the, 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 yes. the, the, the lame, and he starts eating with what they all thought were unclean people, people that were getting drunk, people that were having, you know, illicit relationships, people that were, you know, unclean, sinners. Yeah. And who does Jesus go to? The very thing that just smacks of upheaval, of usurping their authority. Right. Like Jehu. Yep. He's destroying the temple, the, the purpose for the temple. Praise the Lord. Matthew 21, verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, this is what he tells his disciples, but, he, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Amen. What mountain? The mountain that the temple sets on. That's where they're headed back for. The background for this conversation is they're looking at the temple mount. They're headed back to the temple. Praise God. Amen. If you trust Jesus, you have power to move mountains. The mountains of legalism, the mountains of religion, the mountains of condemnation, the mountains of self-doubt, the mountains of self-guilt. All of that can be destroyed. And you can do it by simply believing in Jesus. He is our temple. He is our Messiah. You can move the mountains of religion. You can move those mountains, those, those things that keep us in bondage, that keep us unclean in their eyes and therefore in our own eyes. Praise God. This isn't about extraordinary power in prayer. I, I, although that's true, we do have great power in prayer. That's not what this scripture is about. Jesus is giving us the strength and the courage and a reminder that this is about him. It's not about religious institutions. It's not about religious dogma. It's not about religious traditions. This is about him. The one who said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Yes. Lo, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Yes. Right. Who died once for all. You, not just the sins you com committed up until the time you began to be a believer, but every sin that would ever be committed in your life. Yes. Beginning to end. Yes. No more sacrifices. Right. No more ritual. No. No. Just faith in God. Who said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. 
Amen. I want to bless you so you can be the head and not the tail. I'm going to be with you no matter how much you screw up. You can't out-screw up God's grace. You can't do enough to stop God from loving you. Believe me, if it could be done, I'm, I'm right there at the top of the list. Me and Paul, chiefest of sinners. Praise God. God. See, the new place God dwells is in people who trust in Jesus. Who believe God, the walking temple. God in the flesh. So instead of blowing us off the planet after hundreds of years, thousands of years of disobedience, of rebellion, unfaithfulness, he resurrects from a grave and sends his spirit to dwell in us. We are now his dwelling place. His temple. Heaven and earth collide right here. God's always taken one more step towards us. And every time he does, he reveals himself in a little less guarded way. More grace. He wants us to know him intimately. He wants us to trust his love. He wants to make himself known. And to do that, he makes himself vulnerable. He relentlessly pursues us and chases us. God in temple. God in Jesus. And now, God in us. Revelation 21, verse 3. Praise God. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They'll be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. All right. <clears throat> Isaiah 11, verse 9. Isaiah 11, 9. Last scripture. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Amen. That word knowledge is yada, Hebrew word, and it means intimacy. Yes. It actually means oneness. Now, let me ask you, how does water cover the sea? That's always baffled me. I guess just me, but, you know, you ask questions sometimes because it, after all, it, it, it's the word of God, but yet it doesn't make sense sometimes. How does water cover the sea? Full intimacy. Connected. One. You can't separate us from him. From his glory. Our tabernacle his glory are one. Mm -hmm. So completely integrated that we are literally one with God. Yeah. You, if you think that there's sin in your life, that there's something unforgiven, if you think that you know something's not right, let me let me give you a clue. You are the holy of holies. Yes. Yes, we are. If you're not, God can't dwell there. That's right. 
He made us the holy of holies, the holiest place that there is, so that he could come and dwell in us. Yes. God said that. Yes, he did. If you're looking for more glory, if you're looking anywhere but here, or in you, you're looking in the wrong place. Praise God. Know ye not that you are the temple of God? Know ye not that that Shekinah glory is part of you? And let me just quit with this. That's why this scripture means something. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. God has shown up at the tabernacle. He's come to his temple. And there's a glory cloud. Whether we see it or not, it's there. And the more we believe it, the more the water covers the sea. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you don't believe God's a good God, you just don't know God. That's the truth. He has come to his temple, and he's never leaving. Hallelujah. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week. No, you're not. You are the temple of God. Hallelujah. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Shake hands with one another. Tell them I see the glory.